yeah this is e 6322 VLSI broadband communication circuits So, first of all we have uh, uh, four lectures a week, but I think I will try to organize it so that uh, essentially it averages out to three lectures a week and at the end we will have some uh, presentations by students. This is how I had done it when I had uh, taken this course long back, although last time it was slightly different. So, we will have uh, assignments. because this is. Uh, uh, course that deals with somewhat complicated circuits, which uh, you can only go so far by doing uh, pencil on paper analysis, right. So, you have to do simulations and so on. So, we will have uh, assignments based on simulation as well as analysis and we will have the usual mid sem and end sem and finally, there will be a project which is essentially a larger assignment hopefully. And finally, and uh, I am hoping to do this, which I used to do long back, <coughs> where you should read a paper that is relevant to this uh, broadband communications course and present it in class. And that will, the logistics of that will take many classes. So that's why I said roughly three lectures a week. Okay. So first, uh, we'll look at what the course is all about, right. It says VLSI broadband communication circuits which uh, may or may not make much sense. Now, essentially what it is, is about pushing large amounts of data through some channels, okay. Now, I think all of you know that the amount of data that is being transported is increasing probably exponentially year by year, month by month and so on, okay. So, every one of you will have some smartphone or some other device which pushes in data. The amount of data data that you yourself work with is increasing, right. Before you were only, you only had text messages, now you have uh, more complicated stuff, videos and so on. The videos are also getting better and better. So, there is more and more data everywhere, okay. We will not worry too much about why the data is there, but our job is to push that data out as, uh, as uh, efficiently as possible, okay. Now, because you have more and more data and you have the same amount of time to transfer it, your data rates have been increasing which provides a number of challenges, okay. And uh, this works at different levels, right, uh, different levels of abstraction. What we will be looking at is at the IC design level, essentially we will assume that we have a printed circuit board or some channel through which we have to push very high speed data and the kind of circuits that you will need to build in order to increase the data rate, okay. Or rather what will happen to the circuits as you go on increasing the data rate, okay. So, let us say I will show you some examples. I think we should be okay even without full screen. Clearly something is wrong with one of the on this cable. Okay, uh, let it be like that for now. This shows a sort of uh, <coughs> a very rough picture of what is inside a computer. So, you see the central processing unit and the RAM, okay, and obviously they have to communicate to each other. And inside the chip itself, these chips are quite large, large in the sense like many, maybe couple of tens of millimeters, and the number of transistors and the amount of data processed in each chip is increasing. So, even within the chip, you need like more and more data. And let us say this is a board with the a CPU and memory and that connects to the outside world. So, outside world as well as other things inside the computer. So, you have the hard disk 
which uh, connects to this. A lot of data has to pass between the hard disk and the uh, processing units. Uh, you also know that, again, the hard disk capacity has been increasing, right? I mean, maybe, so when I was a student here at IDM uh, 20 years back, so there used to be one common computer in the hostel. And uh, they, people were thrilled that I wasn't too much into computers, but the thrilled with a state-of-the-art new PC which had 100 megabytes of uh, hard disk. So <laughs> now I think if there is 100 megabytes of hard disk lying around, you probably would not pick it up. So uh, clearly now, I mean, my desktop has two terabytes of uh, hard disk. Okay, what is the factor? How much is it? Twenty thousand. So I'm not going to wait 20,000 times as long for the data to get transferred, right? So it had better do it like much, much, much faster than it used to do it then. And then you have graphics, which also is getting more complicated. Now you can see that, uh, and then you have Ethernet, which connects you to the outside world, USB, which connects you to various peripherals, PCI Express, which connects you to various gadgetry inside the uh, computer. Now one of the things you can notice is that uh, every one of them says gigabits per second. Okay, like many gigabits per second. Between the CPU and RAM, there are many lines and each of them carries data of uh, many gigabits per second. So is Ethernet, the fastest Ethernet now is 10 gigabits Ethernet and then USB itself is now, USB 3 is 5 gig. Uh, this SATA that connects to the hard disk is 16 gigabits per second. These things were all at a low speed and then over time, uh, the speed has been increasing. Now one of the reasons the speed has been increasing is that uh, <coughs> uh, you have certain amount of data, the amount of data has doubled. Now one way to keep the speed the same is you also double the number of wires over which you connect the data, okay. So that way, yeah, I had four wires and on each one I send 100 megabits per second. Now I have eight wires, also 100 megabits per second. I don't have to change the circuits, but this is not scalable, certainly not for uh, orders of magnitude increase in data because you can't increase the number of wires by uh, orders of uh, magnitude because I mean you also have size limitations. In fact, the size you want to shrink further, okay. And in some cases it's not even possible. Like for instance, you have uh, like undersea cable connections and things like that. You can't go and say that, hey, lay one more cable just because my data has doubled. You have to find some way of uh, doubling the data rate through the given channel, okay. So in general, I mean, the trend has been not to increase the number of wires or number of channels through which you send the data, but increase the data rate through each channel. Okay, which anyway helps, even if you have more channels, it's only going to help you send more data, okay. And then you have Sonnet, which is the sort of network that connects uh, over long distances, okay. That is at 40 gigabits per second. You have backplanes. Essentially, they are large PCBs. You have uh, sort of hierarchical structure. You have smaller uh, computers that connect to larger computers and the network will have a backplane. And on that, you have 56 gigabits per second. People want 100 key, hundreds of gigabits per second and so on, okay. So, uh, <coughs> the channels through which you send data also have been improving, uh, but not as quickly as uh, the amount of data that you want to send, okay. So you do use all those improvements at the same time, uh, first of all it is like infrastructure, you can't go and change it, okay. So just like you build a road and you can't double the number of uh, lanes like every now and then, right, you have to build it with some long term vision. After that, if you have a lot of traffic, you somehow have to manage it, it's up to you. Similarly, it's the same thing here. You can't go on changing the, what is in the like built up everywhere. You have to change like how you send the data. So that has led to like more and more sophisticated uh, circuitry. Essentially, we will look at, uh, not the details, the details can be quite complicated, but at least the underlying principles of how you go on sending more and more data through channels which are not very good, okay. So what is it that we want to send? <coughs> Essentially, we send digital signals. This course is all about sending digital signals. We know that uh, digital is better, or do we know that? Is it better? Is digital better to send digital data? Why? Huh? Yeah, so what is good about it? Is it a store? Actually, that's one of the main things. I mean, the main motivation behind having everything converted to digital form is it's easier to store as ones and zeros. And the reason it's easier to store is because, again, like he said, there are only two levels. It's easier to distinguish between them. 
actually it turns out the quantity that is stored let us say on the hard disk does not exactly have only two levels, but uh, whatever levels there are from that you try to distinguish only two levels okay? as opposed to if you had to distinguish like uh, if you had to exactly determine all the values between let us say 0 and 1 volt it would be a lot more difficult. Now, you have something close to 0 something close to 1 volt and then you call this 0 and call that 1 that is what is easy. So, I think it is a given I think you know that uh, we have lots of digital data and we have to send digital data. Okay? Now, the digital data only means that uh, typically uh, what it means is that uh, first of all uh, you have discrete units of data and each data can take discrete values. Okay? Now, of course, the number of values it can take can be anything you have 64 bit registers where it takes 65,000 values etcetera, but uh, here again we are talking about uh, like the cutting edge of communications right high speed communication. So, we cannot send a signal with like large number of levels in practice we send either binary digital data like this the one on the left side which has I mean typically I use minus 1 and 1 instead of 0 and 1. So, this has two values either minus 1 or 1 and this we have to send the uppermost one shows you symbols with respect to some discrete axis n okay? that is how it is right you have discrete symbols and that is what you have to send. Now, of course, these uh, signals will be these bits will be arranged in time. So, what it means is that <coughs> you have a certain amount of uh, time certain interval for each bit okay? that is called this uh, T s for that amount of time you hold this value either plus 1 or minus 1 and then you send it okay? and to define that bit interval or T s you have a periodic signal whose period equals T s. Okay? This you always have right? because finally, these uh, this signal that you send is actually an analog signal it is a it has it is either a voltage or a current that is defined for all instants of time. Okay? Now, how does it map to the digital signal you identify some interval as the bit interval and over that interval you try to hold a certain constant value either plus 1 or minus 1 okay? and to define that interval you need some other signal which is periodic and that is known as the clock. So, this data and clock are part of every digital communication uh, network or when you have a uh, when you have digital data basically this is what you will have there will be a clock which defines the interval for uh, each uh, symbol and then you have the data which is an analog signal which changes only at the boundaries of those intervals hopefully. Okay? Now, because we are uh, looking at very high speed uh, data transmission the number of uh, discrete levels in the signal is small we have either 2 or sometimes 4 do very rarely do we go beyond this. So, in this case you have either minus 2 minus sorry actually this should be minus 3 minus 1 plus 1 and plus 3. So, that the symbols are equally spaced. Okay? So, you have four equally uh, space symbols and it can. So, basically here you have four possible values again you have a clock okay? and then there are also some special cases where you have uh, you have actually binary data, but you send it through a signal which takes on three values either plus 1 minus 1 or 0. There are reasons to do this we will come to this later. It also has to do with how to push like high speed data through a channel that may or may not support that speed. Okay. So, we are now uh, although we say digital we are also looking at a very restricted case where we have a small number of levels in every uh, simple interval okay. typically 2, 3 or 4. Now, uh, <coughs> basically the point is that you have to send some data like this which is I think the classical way in which you draw digital data right you draw these rectangular boxes corresponding to each symbol and that is sent over some channel. So, there are two problems one is how to send that uh, data when this T s is very small. Okay? So, you have to realize circuits which will uh, generate this data with a very small T s. Okay? Like I said people are looking at uh, 10 gigabits per second is now old 10 gigabits per second means that this T s is how much? Huh? Yeah, 100 picoseconds, right? It is quite a small amount of time, but 110 gigabits per second is not even the fastest. People are talking about uh, 25 gigabits per second, in which case you have only 40 picoseconds per interval, and then even 56 gigabits per second is small. Okay? So, you have very little time. So, you can even without knowing anything else, you can guess that the circuits that generate these data can be very challenging to build. Okay? 
and then you send this data through some channel you can think of it as a wire. Now, what comes out does not look anything like this. First of all, what you generate itself does not look like this rectangular blocks of data and then what comes out of the other side of the wire looks even worse it may not even look anything like this. So, <coughs> one of the problems is to restore it so that it looks at least somewhat like this digital data that is one part of the problem. The other part is that uh, you have to detect what the symbols are ok meaning uh, the data looks like this at this point it does not look uh, like a very meaningful thing meaning I already know that it is plus 1 here and minus 1 there. So, but what I am saying is when you get to the receiver it may not exactly look like that ok. Now, we are again talking about digital data that is once in every T s seconds we have to figure out the sign of the symbol ok. So, essentially you should have a clock which defines where the symbol intervals are and within each clock period you should also tell what the values are ok. So, that is the receiver that is where I mean once you have this you have a clock and corresponding to that clock you have the symbol values then your job is done I mean as far as uh, <coughs> this course is concerned. Now, of course, there may be other circuits which may do lots of things with the data and so on we would not worry about it. Our stuff is to get the raw data from one side to another ok and what we will look at is uh, uh, ways of uh, doing this ok. Now, uh, I think you already know that typically this is how you draw digital data, but this is not necessary especially those of you who have taken communication courses know that either the plus 1 or the minus 1 can be represented by other possible uh, symbols that is instead of having a full pulse like this you can have only a half duration pulse. Now, it turns out that those things make some aspects of the reception easier ok. Many times what happens is that this clock you do not know what the clock is you will get only the data and from the data you have to infer the clock ok. So, that is one big part of it and it turns out that the second case where you have this half pulse it is easier to do that ok. But on the other hand <coughs> again we are looking at the context of pushing as high speed data as possible over a wire ok. For that this is not the optimal thing ok. So, this kind of thing where you hold the uh, symbol value over the entire bit duration which is called non return to 0 transmission that is the most optimal and that is what we will be using ok. Because if you look at other low speed stuff there are lots of options, but for us like we are looking at very high speed data transmission. So, there are few options ok. And it turns out we will later see that uh, if your channel behaves somewhat like a low pass filter this rectangular pulse is the most optimal ok. So, this is what I tried to show <coughs> what you send may be like this black boxy stuff and what you receive this is a very mild case by the way it looks like this blue stuff which has uh, which takes some time to rise from 0 to I mean minus 1 to 1 which is what you expect no signal rises abruptly from minus 1 to 1. So, the values that you detect may not exactly be binary, but from that you have to infer the binary values. So, somewhere in the receiver you will always have what is known as a decision circuit which takes the signal maybe this blue signal and then takes the clock maybe this clock like this where the clock comes from we will see later, but uh, at the rising edge of the clock you detect the value of the symbol and so on ok. So, this decision circuit is uh, part of the receiver. So, what you receive at the output of the decision circuit are the digital symbols at this point your job is done ok because you have some clock and at every edge of the clock you know what the symbol value is ok. So, finally, we have to get to this, but there are lots of challenges by the time we get to that one ok. Now, <coughs> we will go through these things in more detail I am just trying to quickly give you an introduction. Now, this right this is actually this process happens everywhere it is not only that hey I am try sending a signal from uh, the CPU I mean the CPU motherboard to the hard disk and so on ok. It is not only over those things even within a single chip this happens right. You have digital data that is generated somewhere and you have to send it somewhere else ok. Now, in the most uh, I mean the simplest case what happens is that you have the data that is available and you also have the clock that generated the data 
Okay, so if you want to figure out what the data is, you put data into the D input of a flip flop, clock into the clock input of a flip flop, and output comes the received data. That's all. In the simplest cases, when the interconnection is very short, this is all you do. If you have both data and the clock, you feed the D to the data to the D input, clock to the CK input, and what you get out are the symbol values. Okay. Now, uh, what the D flip flop does is that even if this amplitude is not fully plus one and minus one, at the output it will regenerate the uh, the full amplitude. Okay, that's the purpose of the D flip flop. But we'll see later that uh, things are like lot more complicated than this. Okay. Introduction: You can see that you have these big data centers, you have links on a single chip, and you have chip to chip. Like I said, this works in a hierarchy. So. You have a chip, which uh, maybe is of the order of, let's say, large chips will be 20 millimeters by 20 millimeters, and you may have to send data from there to there. Okay. Now, on a chip, the wires are very thin, and so on. So this itself provides, I mean, this itself poses some challenge. <coughs> now, this chip, I'm showing the cross-sectional view now. Gets connected to the package or the board through some wires. Those wires also will do something to the data. And then on the board, you may have other chips which are close by. It may be on the same package, it may be on the same board. Okay. So you have to have a data going from one chip to another chip. And this board may be connected to another larger board. So the data has to go here. And then that may be connected to another board and so on. Okay. So, there are hierarchies of uh, <coughs> distances over which you have to transmit data. On a chip, it will be over a few millimeters. On a single, I mean small board, it may be a few centimeters. On a large board, it may be a few tens of uh, centimeters. And finally, when you get out on the network, it may be like many meters and kilometers and so on. Okay. So finally, what you want is you want error free operation that is you want all the data that you send to be received without any errors and a big equation a big uh, variable in the whole thing is the amount of power that you consume to send data. As you will see the faster you want to send the data the more uh, power you have to burn. Okay. So essentially we have to minimize the amount of energy you spend in sending every bit otherwise right. Uh, the amount of power that you burn becomes enormous. Now, it is now estimated that uh, I think all of you have heard of data centers, right? Now, big data is all the rage. So, you have this huge data centers where lots of data is stored, and it is estimated that I think 15 percent or more of that is simply the power consumed in that. These data uh, centers are also huge consumers of power. That is why, like uh, Google and so on, when they build their data centers, they also have their own power plants, etcetera, just to power that. Okay? And the cooling solution for those uh, data centers is also a big uh, complicated challenge. Now, uh, out of that power, let me see if I have the chart here, maybe not. Uh, ah, yeah. So, in the network, you have. Uh, So basically, uh, this is the data center, okay, and the networking that is basically the part that transmits data from one place to another place that consumes 60 percent of the power. And out of that, I mean that includes everything, and out of that, the interconnect, meaning basically just the sending the data through wires that connect between different points, that consumes like 27 percent of the power, okay. So basically, you can compute that about 15 percent of the power in the data center is simply going in, taking data back and forth between different points. Okay, and it's an enormous amount of uh, power. Okay, so reducing this power will uh, reduce the overall power of the data center. Will also contribute to essentially reduced energy consumption. Okay, and the same thing happens within a processor itself. Uh, where is this now? So, yeah, this red part here and this red part here, basically they are the ones, uh, they are the power that is uh, consumed in transmitting data from one point to another within the processor. Okay. 
So, even within a processor about 20 percent of the data simply goes in taking data from one place to another ok processor or memory. And you can see basically on the same package now you have this multi core computers and multi cores means there are multiple processors and obviously, these multiple processors are useful only if you can connect them and have data go efficiently I mean and very quickly between them. Otherwise, I mean if the data is the bottleneck then there is no point having like so many cores right. So, that again you can see the amount of uh, data that sent this is terabits per second right. So, that is a lot. <coughs> so, essentially the goal uh, I hope you can see this. This uh, parameter here, this energy per bit, okay, that is something that you want to minimize. That tells you basically to transmit every bit how much energy you are consuming. Okay, the holy grail is to come to at least the current holy grail. This is like a technological limitation. Is come to one picojoule per bit. What does one picojoule per bit mean? If you have uh, ten gigabits per uh, second data that is being transmitted between two points, let's say. So, that is 10 gigabits per second. So, it means how much 10 giga times 1 pico how much is that 10 milli. So, that is 10 milli joules per second or 10 milli watts ok. So, if you have 10 gigabits per uh, second then the transmitter and the receiver together should consume 10 milli watt. If you are uh, if you are conforming to this 1 pico joule per bit level that is actually a very small amount of power consumption as you simulate circuits you will appreciate this more. So, with uh, for a you should be able to build a 10 gigabits per second link within 10 milliwatts. So, similarly if you are allowed like this 10 pico joules per bit that will become 100 milliwatts and so on ok. But this directly I mean the overall amount of uh, energy spent in transmitting data is directly proportional to this number. So, you would like to keep this number as uh, small as possible ok. And of course, people have been making efforts which will try to survey or at least get a glance of the techniques that have been used and there are various reasons why you get these improvements ok. One is technology, the technology itself has been improving and people have been improving the circuits they use. So, our focus is mainly on the circuits because we have no control over the technology we will have to take whatever technology that is currently usable and use that. But you do see that this is what this uh, this scatter plot shows is uh, publications in the leading journal in the field the IEEE journal of solid state circuits and <coughs> you can see maybe around uh, I mean in the early part of the century people were taking hundreds of picojoules per bit. Now, it has come down to like there is a spread of course, because uh, not every link is the same there are some may be short some may be long and so on. You cannot expect that if you have a very short link you consume some power and if you have a much longer link you expect to consume more power because you may have to do some more processing ok. But still you can see the overall trend that is kind of falling ok. So, let me go back to this. So, hopefully that will convince you that uh, <coughs> first of all that the serial links essentially links that transport data are important and they are also challenging because uh, I mean it is not that we are taking some small part of something and then trying to like focus our attention on it. We already saw that uh, substantial amount of power in a data center when you think of data center you think of something that stores data, but as I showed basically uh, simply moving the data from here and there between uh, here and there in a data center takes a considerable amount of energy ok. So, it is worthwhile paying attention to this part of it and then build circuits that are more efficient. So, that is the focus of this course ok. So, let me. <coughs> so, yeah this shows some examples let me just run through these things there is a supercomputer and a data center and so on everywhere you have lots of data going back and forth. And this is on a board you have the uh, processor cores and the memory ok. So, you can see like everything is in the high gigabits per second ok. So, everything is difficult that is all I want to say. 
and uh, for graphics you can see that the amount of uh, graphics terabits I mean this uh, it is approaching like 1 terabit per second ok over the time. So, everything I mean everywhere you are, we are using more data I think this is kind of obvious. Now, <coughs> many places you have the processor and the memory and you can connect it up like this. This distance is not very large in that uh, in the absolute sense it is like few tens of millimeters 20 millimeters ok, but uh, it still takes a lot of energy. A better scheme is to put this uh, DRAM chip on top of the GPU chip. So, that the connection is very short now right whatever was going from here to there now only has to go from there to there ok. So, that is one of the ways of sort of technological ways of reducing the amount of energy because you make the link itself short. So, that you spend less energy in transmitting data through that. Our focus is not this, but I am just showing you like other kinds of things that are also done. So, this is from a particular paper which uh, uh, I mean I hope I have some details somewhere else, but anyway. So, you have these links where uh, between CPU and memory and you also have these optical links like for long distance communication you use optical links because uh, the loss in an optical fiber is very very small ok compared to loss in a an electrical cable right. So, when you have want links of which are many many kilometers long optical fiber is the only way to go, but that also has lots of impairments. So, to push more and more data through an optical fiber you need the same techniques that we have been you we will discuss for sending uh, high speed data through wires. So, again I think now this is a well known theme the data rate is increasing and energy efficiency is improving that is the amount of energy per bit is increasing uh, sorry decreasing. This I already showed. Now, these are other kinds of links again we will not discuss these per se, but uh, many of the techniques may be applicable to this. So, here what they have are uh, two chips like one on top of each other and they are not even making contact with each other that is that itself can be difficult the technology to make uh, electrical contacts. So, what they have are these little squares are coils ok. <coughs> there are coils on this layer and coils on that layer and this coil communicates with that coil through inductive coupling ok. So, instead of actually physically connecting them you can have inductive coupling and that again has uh, similar challenges. Everywhere right you will have uh, some amount of energy that you have to transmit in order to get a certain amount of bitter rate. I think in a very general sense this you know from communication systems right. So, you have a certain amount of noise that gets added to overcome that you have to send a certain amount of energy ok. So, this is their chip photo this is just I am showing it out of curiosity basically in this area there are 1024 transceivers and each transceiver is the small square that is shown here ok. This is so that again you can transmit a so you have the DRAM and the GPU the amount of data is very large. So, you have 1000 transmitters between the GPU and the <laughs> this is a sort of abstract depiction of what we what we want to do we have the transmitter we have the channel like I said anything can be a channel typically in our case it is a wire of some sort, but like I said it does not have to be wires it can be an inductively coupled link it can be an optical fiber and a receiver ok. Now, what can this be what can be this channel it can be anything when we say it is a wire it is some sort of transmission line you have to model it in the next uh, slide I will show the possible models ok. So, you have different models for different contexts and you have optical fiber and so on ok. So, this can change the pulse if you send a rectangular pulse here something that comes here can be like very small and looks nothing like a rectangle. So, that has to be fixed. <coughs> so, this is the same thing transmitter channel and receiver. Now, if you have like very very short distances when I say short this is relative we are talking about electrically short uh, uh, channels meaning it is always relative to the data symbol period that you want to send or data rate that you want to send. So, for a given data rate there will always be some wire that can be thought of a short and something that is long and so on ok. So, if it is very short there is nothing this wire goes there that is all it is an ideal wire that means that whatever signal you send here you get there ok and you can see this is kind of the case where you do not have to do anything special ok. 
Now, as it uh, <coughs> becomes longer, when I say longer, it could be that it is the same piece of wire, but your symbol interval is getting shorter, that is a possibility. It could be that you can model it as a lump R C, that is 1 R and 1 C is enough. Okay. So, it takes some amount of time for this capacitor to charge. So, whatever you send as a rectangle here will not be a rectangle. It could be that this kind of model is not applicable and there is a significant inductive component that you have to include. So, now you have R L and C. So, that means that not only will the pulse be smooth, there could be ringing and things like that. Okay. And this also may not be an adequate model in that uh, when you go to long enough uh, interconnects, you may not be able to represent it by a single R and single C. You have to distribute it, you have to cut up the R and cut up the C. And you know this is how things are in real life, right. If you have a wire like this, it is not as though the resistor is here and the capacitor is there. At every point there is a resistor, a small piece of a resistor and a small piece of a capacitor. So, that is what is known as a distributed network. Again, from your transmission line basics you know this. So, or you may have to uh, represent it as a full fledged transmission line with uh, R L G and C. This includes everything right. This is uh, it includes the series inductance of the line, the series resistance of the line, the capacitance between let us say the line and ground and then the any loss resistance between the line and ground. So, you may have to use this. So, as the data rate increases or essentially the channel length increases in an electrical sense. Okay. Do not think of like let us say 1 centimeter channel as very long or very short it can be very long also in some cases and it can be very short in some other cases depending on the context. So, you have to go to more and more sophisticated models. Okay. So, <coughs> now uh, uh, this is a very general introduction, so I would not go too further uh, too much further into this. Uh, when you send data through a channel, you have uh, essentially two things to do. Uh, one is of course, like detecting what the symbols are and before that you may have to restore the uh, waveform to something that resembles a digital signal. Okay. So, that is known as equalization and the process of uh, getting the actual symbols out is known as data recovery or clock and data recovery. Okay. So, quickly let me show these cases. <coughs> there are essentially two types of uh, links that is here I am sending like n channels of data and I am also sending the clock along with that. Okay. But it turns out that this clock by the time it gets here may not be aligned properly to the data and you have to align the clock correctly. So, this is one particular case this is known as the links with forwarded clocks these kinds of links. Okay. Now, these types of uh, links are uh, or also source synchronous links or mesochronous links I will get into the details of the terminology. These types of links are typically used when you have a large number of channels. So, then sending using one more channel to send the clock is not an overhead. If n is let us say 16 or 32 or something, you have add just one more channel for the clock. Now, a more complicated case is when you send only the data, but you do not send the clock. Although you know the nominal frequency, you will not know exactly what the frequency is. So, you have to recover the clock from this side. Okay. So, this is a little more difficult and, but this is also something that is commonly done. Now, this is done many times first of all when n is small. So, let us say n is just uh, 0, I mean that is you have only one channel. Then putting one more channel for the sake of the clock seems like uh, excessive, right? it may not be possible. Okay. And sometimes the standards mandate that you do not send the clock, you send only the data. Like for instance, the USB is such that you have uh, the traditional USB has 4 lines two for the power supply and two for data, but there is no clock that is sent. You have to actually infer the clock from the data transitions. And I mean obviously, if you are an optical fiber, you are not going to lay out another fiber just for sending the clock. right? So, there are many cases where you have to do this. So, we will look at all of these uh, aspects in the course. So, this uh, this consists of two parts. <coughs> First is restoring the waveform 
and later you will see that the waveform can be very bad ok, it does not look anything like the digital data that you want to send. This is known as uh, equalization and recovering the data and this necessarily means you have to also recover the clock aligned to data ok and this is known as clock and data recovery ok. So, we will study both these aspects, we will study clock and data recovery first because uh, uh, I mean that is there everywhere whether the channel is very challenging whether it uh, changes the waveform or not we still have to recover the clock and data and after that we will look at equalization which is about uh, restoring the waveform to the uh, roughly digital shape is it ok. So, from the next class onwards we will start looking at the details of uh, each of these things ok. So, we will look at uh, what the channels are, what they can do to the data and then uh, we will look at the clock recovery, various architectures of clock recovery, what challenges you face when you try to implement them at very high speed. Again the context is high speed right, we are not doing this at some run of the mill speed where you uh, put a deep flip flop and then it works ok, everything is at high speed. So, that is a challenge and then we will look at equalization and so on ok.